Thank you, Anna, for the introduction and to BPS and AstraZeneca for this prize. Thank you to the conference organisers for the honour of giving this presentation. Now, when you attend a talk on equality, diversity and inclusion, I wonder if there are certain stereotypes that come into your mind. Perhaps you think of a list of protected characteristics that either you identify with or perhaps you don't. Now, whilst these characteristics are important and we need to measure them in order to establish progress, I think there is a danger when we reduce equality, diversity and inclusion to certain individual characteristics. Because as we all know, you may have two individuals who look the same on paper, but have entirely different perspectives and life stories to tell. I believe that each one of us is actually a complex mixture of all the stories that we have, and they make us who we are. And each one of us can bring something into society and into the workplace that nobody else can bring. It's perhaps put best by the, the author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who talks about the dangers of telling a single story, that the problem sometimes with stereotypes is not so much that they're untrue, they may be, but that they make it seem as if one story is the only story. And I feel quite strongly that as more people, whether that be researchers and community members, are empowered to tell their stories, we start to see the real rich diversity that we have as a scientific and research community. Wouldn't life be boring and wouldn't ideas be very one-sided if everybody had the same perspective? When considering how to frame this talk, I thought I would divide it into two sections. First off, I'm going to tell some of my own story. Now, there were times when it has actually felt like climbing a mountain with a heavy rucksack. Some of the stories I share may seem quite raw, and I do that because they were important. They have shaped my perspective, and I would not be doing the work I am today if it had not been for many of them. But if you do feel that some of them are a bit too raw or you want to reach out and get in touch, please do so. And the second part of the talk is more like gazing out over the landscape and seeing how your story becomes part of the biggest story and how we can use that to really make a difference. Often when I'm giving career talks, I start in 1999 when I got married in graduation week. But there are a couple of layers that I don't always talk about. So in 99, I was also given a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so a kind of connective tissue disorder. And in some ways, at the time, it just seemed random. It explained a lot of things. But probably the reason it took until that point for me to have the diagnosis was that I had actually entered medical school as a 17-year-old care leaver. And whilst I'd been in hospital quite a few times as a teenager with things like non-accidental non injury and so forth, nobody had really been paying you know, that much attention to my own health. Anyway, time moved on. My junior doctor years were pretty typical for the time. You can look back at things that would, would in this day not be considered acceptable. But by the time I got my MRCP, I was quite convinced that I wanted to somehow work in global health. Another thing that happened that year was I got appendicitis and it, it was quite sort of mucky and I was off work for about a month after the surgery. And at the end of a certain job, I was given a reference that said that I was too physically frail to consider working in the tropics. Now that was actually really painful. But one of my registrars said to me at the time that sometimes the only way to prove people wrong is to say nothing but to prove them wrong. But one of my professors was also wise but influential and said, why don't you go out to Malawi to the research unit and see how firstly you get on with your health, but also see if you can come up with a good idea for a research fellowship. Now, at that time, there were not yet any antiretrovirals widely available in Africa. So what I saw was people younger than myself dying of HIV and TB. And not only that, that often after starting TB treatment, there would be a paradoxical deterioration. And nobody understood why that was happening. And that was the basis of my Welcome Research Fellowship. Was it an immunological thing? Was it a drug-resistant pathogen? Was it an alternative diagnosis? What was happening here? 
it was a wonderfully rich experience to be immersed in a research environment in an African setting. And it confirmed that this was what I wanted to do. And then a couple of years after that, we had our first child. Now, it had taken a while to reach that point personally, because on one side of my family, there's a kind of intergenerational cycle of addiction and abuse. And I think many of us know that these behaviors do tend to, to repeat themselves. And I wanted to be quite certain that I would not. And on the other side of my family is the Ellis Danlos. So I needed some medical advice about whether this would even be safe. So when I was pregnant, I started talking about going part time. And I remember a lot of colleagues raising eyebrows a bit and saying, really, if you want to be serious, you're at an early stage in your career, you need to prove yourself. You, why don't you go full time and get a nanny and then you can have everything all at once. And I wasn't quite sure, but that time I didn't get a chance to find out because when she was nine weeks old, she unexpectedly went asystolic. And whilst we did immediate bystander CPR and got an output, it was at the expense of significant hypoxic brain injury. And she died six weeks later in Johannesburg. Now, bereavements, tragedies, life altering events and diagnoses, they happen and they will happen to all of us at some point or other. But for me, there was a real sense of not asking why this had happened, but what do I do now? How do I make sense of this and move forward? There was one day I felt very strongly that my daughter didn't really have a chance at life, but I did. So how could I make sure that every single day counted? There is a side effect it has left me with, which is a kind of complete inability to plan ahead. I have no idea what lies ahead. I don't think any of us do, but we often convince ourselves we do. I don't know, for example, if my children will live to grow up. I don't know how long I will live. I don't know what's around the corner. But what I do know is I've got today and I know what my responsibilities are for today. So I can work at these things with my whole heart and not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will either come or it won't, but we can't change that. But that's not to minimize the effect that grief has on you. It's difficult to put it into words, and I feel these sculptures do better justice, but there is a real stigma about baby loss, whether that be infertility, miscarriage, the death of a young child. And if there's a stigma for women, I believe even more so for men who are going through the double grief of the loss of their child, but also trying to support their partner. So it's something that we do need to raise more awareness of. When my daughter died, I was living in Blantar. And there at that time, the under five mortality was one in eight. And most women had around four children. So basically every second woman in Blantar had had a child die under the age of five. It was a very normal, common experience. And after I went back to work, they took me under their wing. My nurse would say to me, oh, yes, I remember when my child was stillborn. I remember this. You would ask an average Malawian woman, how many children do you have? And she would say, well, I had five and praise God, I have two that are living. I understand that now. And it was perhaps the first time I really got this sense of being part of a community. Anyway, I went back to work full time. But about a year later, I had my next son. And when he was 10 months old, we adopted a four month old baby. And he promptly had his own near death experience. You can see him recovering on the high dependency unit. If you look closely, the little green needle serving as an intraosseous. He did exactly what my PhD showed happens. So when you've got ongoing active TB, your innate responses become quite downregulated. So when a second bacterial infection hits, you don't mount that pro-inflammatory response that you should. And it was actually the severe bacterial infection that nearly took him. But thankfully, a good course of broad spectrum antibiotics and TB treatment, and he's now thriving. It does also raise the minor point that if you or one of your family members gets the diagnosis that you're studying, it is extremely difficult to be taken seriously by medical professionals. I had been fobbed off for quite a while because I was just anxious. I was studying TB. I'd had a previous child die, but actually he was desperately sick. Anyway, after all that, I did go part-time, but more importantly, perhaps, was that my husband went less than full-time. And without that, I don't think any of the rest of this story would be possible. It would be interesting to have him give a talk on diversity because 
if there are any structural or prejudice barriers affecting women who choose to go less than full time for family reasons, even more so for the men. It's increasing now, but back then he was seen as quite an oddity. We do sometimes do joint career talks and talks on life work balance because as well as being part time, we share homeschooling our children, which means we can easily move between countries, we can move up country for studies, we can sort of really embrace the adventure that life brings. And we do sometimes do share talks for a faith based organization with which we volunteer. So there we were with two very close together in age young boys. And the first thing I would say is that I'm thankful that in the UK, we do have pretty good maternity leave policies. It's always easy to complain at what you don't have and look to perhaps to Scandinavia or somewhere where it's a bit better. But in Malawi and Uganda, women get three months maximum. In the States, it's even less. And the picture on the far side was us at the World Conference on TB and Lung Disease in Berlin in 2010. So my husband and I both had oral presentations and posters. So what we did is we took it in turns to go into the sessions and the other one of us would wander around the posters looking like this. Now, the TB conference was always quite happy with breastfed babies. There was always quite a little community of us and also some of the dads who were doing their childcare responsibilities. Not all conferences are quite so forward thinking and it's something we should advocate for. And it was around this time I started to get more involved in some of the university initiatives. Athena Swan had not yet quite come into being, but when it did, I was almost first on the list to try and advocate for other people with different caring responsibilities, not just children. So finally, we went back to the UK and I finished my PhD. I discovered just how powerfully you can work in short chunks when your children are napping and almost like power bursts. And then I blinked and I was pregnant again. But unfortunately, this time, it was actually me that got incredibly sick. You see, what happened is I'd had hyperemesis, which was fairly normal for me, but I'd had previous fundal plication surgery and my stomach, well, it broke with the vomiting. So I ended up with intractable vomiting that got worse as the pregnancy progressed. And I became so immunosuppressed that I picked up all kinds of opportunistic infections. And I was basically in and out of hospital for months. And there were days when I actually didn't know if I would survive. And I didn't even care. It was such a dark time. And <laughs> You know, I talk about myself, but think of my husband. He was a medical registrar doing night shifts with two two-year-olds and a sick wife and no family support. Somehow we got through that time. And after the baby was born, apart from the vomiting, everything seemed a lot better. But the other problem I had at that time was my research wasn't really going the way I wanted it to because my TB immunology, whilst fascinating, it was taking me further and further away from the patient and sometimes I would even ask myself, so what, why am, why am I doing this? And I did write a grant application that was rejected on the grounds of being unfocused and half-hearted. And I couldn't agree more. I'm actually very glad it did get rejected. But I had quite a, I've heard it subsequently described as the post PhD wilderness. And it, it was a difficult time. And after a lot of discussion and exploration, I decided the best thing was to go back into full-time NHS work. My clinical specialty is acute medicine. I, I love the excitement and the drama and the energy of the acute unselected take. And so one day I was sitting in one of my professor's offices, breastfeeding my baby and talking about this plan. And then the baby was sick and there was, you know, there was all this posset you can imagine. And somehow, we got onto a conversation about how difficult it must be to measure the amount of drug that goes into a baby if it's the breastfeeding mother that's on the medication. And I thought to myself, surely with HIV, this has been done. It must have been. But I went home that night and did a literature search and I realized it hadn't. And the reason was because of quite an astonishing paradox. So until 2017, in all high-income countries, it was basically illegal for a woman with HIV to breastfeed her baby, even if she was virologically suppressed, even if she was on treatment. She risked referral to child protection services should she be found to be covertly breastfeeding her baby. So, of course, nobody was looking at breastfeeding in those countries. But paradoxically, 
in low income countries where formula milk is not affordable, feasible, acceptable, sustainable or safe, the World Health Organization has recommended exclusive breastfeeding for women living with HIV. Interesting, these two diametrically opposed policies in different parts of the world, shouts of some inequity somewhere along the line. But more importantly, who was there to advocate for the HIV positive breastfeeding mother in a low and middle income country? Now that was what I wanted to know the answer to. So we wrote an Academy of Medical Sciences starter grant, which took us to Uganda for a pilot study and a couple of other small grants. And then pause, finally, in 2014, I had surgery to correct this vomiting. So all of this time, two and a half years, I had been vomiting every day. Every single time I left my house, I had to plan my route carefully, thinking if I'm sick, where, where is it most discreet? Public transport was a nightmare. And I had been trying to access healthcare, of course, I had been put on the waiting list for a certain test, waited a year, had the test, was inconclusive, got put to the back of the waiting list, wrote to the chief executive four times. There is a thing, isn't there? And thankfully, it's getting more attention lately with case studies such as endometriosis, that sometimes when a woman particularly has a condition that maybe is presenting in a slightly atypical manner, she gets dismissed, perhaps told that it's all in the mind. The number of times people told me I couldn't be that sick because I was holding down a job and managing my childcare, but then what, what choice did I really have? And it was only eventually when the surgeons saw how sick I was getting that they took me to theatre. They said, yeah, it was exactly like you said, the stitching had broken, we fixed it, and the vomiting stopped. So that leads me on to thinking about this Ellis Danlos, which I have mentioned. It's actually a collection of conditions caused by different mutations. One of them is life-threatening, but that's not the one that I have. Um, my grandmother had it. She taught ballet till she was 90. She was a Polish Jew born in Warsaw in 1914. She had some amazing stories to tell. But anyway, I grew up, I sort of knew that it wasn't a life-threatening condition, but it causes a few problems here and there. The symbol for Ellis Danlos is the zebra. And the reason is the old story of medical students sitting in a coffee room and they hear a horse going down the corridor, clip clop, clip clop, and they say, aha, it must be a zebra. But one of the reasons for that is that it does have such a diverse range of presentations, often quite nonspecific. Often young women are seen as being perhaps a little bit crazy at times. And unfortunately that was my experience. But other things are the variability. You can see me in a game park running with my son in a 10K and actually doing quite a lot of exercise really helps with joint pain and instability. And some days I run half marathons, but there are days that feel a lot more like this. Some days I'm in so much pain that I can hardly move. Even basic things take time. The number of grants I've actually written from my bed the times when I feel dizzy, sick, my blood sugar, blood pressure get dangerously low and I just, I'm not with it. But the problem is I look exactly the same as I normally look. So unless I was to tell somebody, they would have no idea. And I suppose for me, reflecting back, it was that hurtful comment of you won't be able to do the work that you are passionate about because of your health. I was always scared to speak about how I felt because I thought I'd been I'd be judged, I'd be prohibited from working overseas, and that it would really result in, I suppose, discrimination. And this raises the whole question of hidden disability, something that's getting a lot more attention recently, but there are probably many people that have never felt they've had a voice to speak out. For me now, I do tend to tell colleagues I work closely with, particularly if we're traveling together, just because of some of the things that might happen. But there's never been once when somebody's actually asked me, you know, are there any kind of adjustments to your, to your workplace or anything that might be needed? Hidden disabilities can pop up at different times too. My husband's quite severely dyslexic, but it hadn't really affected him in, in medicine, clinical medicine, until they brought in some of these new electronic medical record systems where you have to toggle between different screens and he finds that ex extremely difficult. So it's just something to be aware of. Anyway, I did write the postdoctoral fellowship grant 
while I was recovering from surgery and we got the fellowship to go to Uganda and look at antiretrovirals in breastfeeding mother infant pairs. We got some other quite large PK studies looking at the dolphin study and one looking at anti-malarials. And given we were stable now, it seemed a very good time to have another baby. And this time you'll be really glad to know that none of us got sick. The only problem was some visa and immigration challenges that went on for a number of years. But from this point, the work really took on a bit of a life of its own. Somebody had told me earlier on in my career that you have to find that thing that you just can't let go of, that you wake up thinking about, that you want to put all your energy and creativity and passion into. And for me, pharmacokinetics in pregnancy and lactation was that area. Perhaps my own experiences of having been at the bedside of my very sick children, having been a sick mother, being given drugs when I wasn't sure about. Perhaps it's that that motivates me. It doesn't work for everybody. But once the enthusiasm comes and the grants start coming in, it does become quite self-perpetuating. And into 2020, I got the second part of my Welcome Fellowship with an associated public engagement grant I'll tell you about in the mo moment. And I finalized the adoption of my daughter. And that is approximately what we look like now. But why tell all these personal stories? Perhaps to empower you. There will be somebody listening to this who feels that they've never been able to speak up about where they're coming from. And those of you that perhaps in more senior roles, be aware of what might be going on in your juniors' lives. But also, because I think it has a direct influence on the work that I am doing subsequently. So just as I find it almost impossible to separate my life and my work, I find it very difficult to separate my research agenda from equality, diversity and inclusion, because the central thesis of all I do is that it is essential to study drug dosing and safety in the populations where those drugs are going to be used. Not only that, it is essential to do it well, and it is essential to build capacity to do this work in the countries where these diseases are prevalent. The dolphin study was quite influential for me. It was actually my first clinical trial. Dolutegravir was a new antiretroviral licensed in 2013. And in non-pregnant adults, it had been shown to reduce your viral load twice as quickly as in the standard of care. So obviously, if a woman comes with untreated HIV in late pregnancy, the priority is to get that viral load down by delivery to reduce the risk of transmission to the infant. So we hypothesized that dolutegravir could be particularly of benefit in a late presenting pregnant population. Also, dolutegravir is a small drug. It has low drug-drug interaction potential, high genetic barrier to resistance, easily co-formulated. So we could see that the WHO was probably going to adopt this. So we wrote the protocol for Dolphin in 2012 before drug licensing, but it did take us several years because of barriers to do the regulatory and ethical processes. Time has changed and partly, again, because of dolutegravir, because whilst we were doing this study, Botswana made the decision that they would just roll the whole national program onto dolutegravir because it seemed so good. And they had a large birth defect surveillance study going on anyway in country. And in 2018, there was a shock interim analysis because of about 426 women who had conceived on dolutegravir, four of them had neural tube defects. This sent a shockwave around the world. All the trials were put on hold, there were safety alerts, and some countries made the decision that until there was more data, women of childbearing age must not receive this drug. Unfortunately, some had already started on it and felt their quality of life was substantially better and it was being taken away. And then something happened that really influenced how I thought, I'll just move the screen slightly. At the World AIDS Conference in Amsterdam in 2018, the activists stormed the stage and they read in full from the Kigali stakeholder consultation. I've reproduced some of it here, but that it's critical not just to see the pregnant women and actually any women of childbearing potential as vessels of babies, but individuals in their own right who deserve access to the very best evidence-based treatment available and the right to choose evidence-based information and the right to choose. They pointed out that none of them had been involved in any of these discussions. And I must confess that there have been days when I myself felt as though I was being treated as a vessel of a baby rather than an individual. 
this was such a public protest that it really transformed the way perhaps the research community thought about doing studies in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And there's been a lot of excellent advocacy that's taken place since then. For the record, as the denominator has increased, the signal regarding birth defect surveillance, birth defects in dolotigvir has minimized and it is now recommended first line for all. So that's pregnancy, but what about breastfeeding? And so my welcome fellowship is the maternal and infant lactation pharmacokinetic or milk study. And we started looking at antiretrovirals in HIV. Now we're doing TB, malaria, bacterial infections. But of course, it's not just women in low income countries who have a right for evidence based information on which to make choices. And there has been a little bit of a default in some high income settings that if we have doubts about the safety of a medication, we simply advise the woman to use formula or perhaps not to take the drug. But is that right? Is it right to deprive a mother and her infant of the potential benefit of breastfeeding simply because we as a research community have not done our job? So we have a work package in Liverpool looking at anti-infectives. And of course, in Uganda, we have quite a lot of expertise on how to do these studies. So we've incorporated a South-North partnership where Rita, she was my research nurse for the first part and is now my study coordinator and PhD student. Rita and I plan to come to the UK and do some training on this when COVID allows. Breastfeeding also got me more into the public engagement side. In 2019, we did a series of activities for World Breastfeeding Week, which included some drama, some songs, some materials translated into different languages and graphic design. And at the bottom, you can see us engaging with an entourage from the Ministry of Health. Now, what the Minister of Health said to me, she said, don't forget to go up country. Don't forget the rural populations because it's very easy for research to be centered in Kampala, but that's very different tribally, linguistically, socio-economically, and so forth. So she said, get into the communities. And so with support from the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences in Liverpool and the Wellcome Trust, we did a public involvement pilot up in Hoima district, so, so up towards Lake Albert. And you can see us having a very energetic launch. Activities, of course, have been somewhat curtailed through COVID, but we've been as flexible as we can. But this project was extremely eye-opening to me for several reasons, because one of the first things people had said to us in the when we did some preliminary data collection was that we want images of people that we can relate to. We want images of people that look like us. And they told us about certain scenarios that they needed health information on. So the scenario represented here is where a pregnant woman goes to antenatal clinic and she gets diagnosed with HIV and started on antiretrovirals, but she doesn't tell her husband because he will be furious, he will accuse her of infidelity, he will possibly beat or abandon her. The fact is he hasn't tested himself and it's likely that he might even be the index case, but this is a scenario that happens all the time. And in the picture, he's found her antiretrovirals, he's confronting her and she is under threat. And we were quite pleased with that first picture and the accompanying graphic. But when we went up country, the village health team workers said to me, no, 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 couple of problems here. One, she's got bare shoulders, she's not dressed right. But secondly, he's not nearly violent enough. He needs to have some kind of weapon stick. So I said, okay, why don't you get into groups and act out there's different scenarios that we're trying to depict and we can get some better photographs. And the final picture is what they acted out for this scenario. This gave me the opportunity, of course, to ask them, does this kind of thing happen often to this degree? And they were like, yeah, all the time. And it made me realize a couple of important points that one, pictorial representation is important, but we need to make sure we don't just reduce it to a characteristic such as skin character. Even my Ugandan colleagues in Kampala were getting it wrong when it came to the villages. The second is that by empowering community members to use perhaps different modalities of presentation helps them to release their own story and to tell their own story. And for me, a major thrust of what I'm trying to do in the engagement work is help people to raise their voices and tell their own stories in a way that changes policy and practice in conditions affecting them. Another example would be 
when we're giving talks on say pharmacokinetics in pregnancy and you want like a silhouette image of a pregnant woman, if you go on Google, the images are almost universally Caucasian or very stereotyped. But why is that? Why can't we develop images that are actually more representative representative of the populations that we're working amongst and the diversity of our population. So I've had some great fun working with a young graphic designer in Cape Town to generate these. And really, probably if there was a theme that went with all of it, it would be attaining equity. So attaining equity of access to research. And I've recently been awarded the Welcome Public Engagement Enrichment Grant to develop this theme. What I want to see is public engagement and involvement throughout all stages of a research project from, from the initial ideas right through to the study activities and the dissemination. You see, many of us, we're busy, aren't we? We're busy researchers, perhaps we're busy clinical academics, and the engagement can seem like either an optional extra or something we tag on at the end to satisfy funders perhaps, but we don't feel that we've got the time or the energy to do it. Now, of course, my area of work lends itself to this very much, but to me, it is absolutely central to sort of really drive this agenda forward. And working amongst communities does have some unexpected benefits. So we measure drugs in breastfeeding using an LC tandem mass spectrometry assays. But one of the things I need is some blank breast milk in order to make up my standards and QCs. And in Liverpool, I had an arrangement with one of the milk banks that they would give me samples when they were time expired in order to make up those samples. I haven't yet quite worked out what I'm doing in Uganda. But at the same time, it became quite clear that there's a group of women that are very keen to donate breast milk for the feeding of premature neonates. So some of these are bereaved mothers. Some of them are women who've previously had children on high dependency or intensive care units. And it's done a little bit informally at the moment. So working with a couple of NGOs and charities, we're seeking to set up a combined therapeutic and research milk bank. So I'll be able to use some of the milk for the assays and also other questions about composition of breast milk and so forth. But even more importantly, babies are gonna get express breast milk, which can protect them very much. But perhaps at the other end of the spectrum to a community milk bank is the point that research has to be done excellently. It's not enough just to do the studies in country. And is it right that clinical trials can be done in Africa, but we have to send all of our samples out and we have to send our data out in order to analyze it? And how do we most safely design studies in complex populations to reduce any risk, to minimize the number of sampling time points and so forth? And that's where grants such as the virtual consortium come in. So we are looking at interactions between second line antiretrovirals and TB treatment. And we use a combination of physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling in Liverpool to inform the starting dose. We've got clinical trials and observational studies in Uganda and South Africa. We're sending the samples to Turin for some intracellular pharmacokinetic measurement. And the population pharmacokinetics is led from Cape Town. So whilst the actual data themselves are quite exciting, we're presenting some at a conference next month, even more exciting to me is the methods, the collaboration, the partnership between clinicians and modelers almost working hand in hand and iteratively going back, refining, refining the models, testing assumptions and so forth. And of course, building capacity for mathematical modeling is not impossible. So lab capacity is a bit more tricky. We are trying to do it, but obviously some of the reagents, some of the equipment required is expensive and difficult to source. But mathematical modeling, you need a decent computer and support in doing it. So Pharmacometrics Africa is an organization that's been running for quite some time. And many members of Virtual are faculty members We've just this month are launching the Uganda chapter of Pharmacometrics Africa, which is really exciting to me because it's actually building that critical mass in our country. Another thing to do with diversity has been the need to raise the profile of some of the female investigators. And it's quite interesting because right now we do have quite a high proportion of excellent young women who form very positive role models. So we're also doing some engagement 
into schools, um, universities, looking at mathematics, engineering, trying to draw other people from other disciplines into the biological areas. I think many of you who've worked in a multidisciplinary way will appreciate the beauty that people that have been trained and think differently bring. Um, there's something very powerful about having a mathematician who's learned biology working with a biologist who's learned mathematics because of the intersection of the perspectives. Another area where it is absolutely essential that we get to the heart of the population in question is pharmacogenomics. Sometimes people talk about Africa as though it's a country, when in fact, it's the most genetically diverse region of the world. So if you have something like a clinical and genetic dosing algorithm for say warfarin anticoagulation, we absolutely must do some work in the countries where those drugs are going to be used. And Professor Munir Pir Mohammed is leading the Warpath Consortium between Kampala and Cape Town. We've had the opportunity to send several students to Liverpool for their masters and have now returned to their countries to sort of set up and establish assays. It also raises the interesting question of consent, because how do you consent somebody for genetic sampling in if they've had a basic level of education, they don't even know what a cell is, and there are certainly no words in their local language that would account for that. How, how do you do that? And one of my PhD students is investigating that. She's using different, different modalities of data presentation. So for example, short video clips or flip charts with infographics, as well as the more standard paper consent form that is read to the participant. This is a key area where community engagement is at the heart. And also acceptability, aspects of acceptability. There are different cultural beliefs about what makes you who you are. And we need to be very careful to understand what it means to somebody to actually look at their DNA. And I've mentioned a couple of times the need to actually empower people from a very early stage. Often, we all know that career decisions, choice of subjects, worldview is formed quite early on. And so actually, if we want to increase the diversity of our scientific and research community, we need to get right out into the schools. We need to empower young women and, and men and other groups who might consider that they are not of the typical demographic to see that this is something that they can actually do if they're given opportunity or support. So the African Women in Science Hub intends to do exactly that. It has the vision to equip empower and inspire women from all stages, from really secondary school through to more senior researchers. We do mentorship, we do panel discussions, we've hosted several power talks on issues that affect women particularly, things like infertility, very stigmatized here, menopause, mental health, and we tend to respond to the needs that emerge. When I reflect back on my earlier career, when I reflect back to the days when I had been told that I could not do a career in global health and I would sometimes go to scientific meetings and I would just feel very other. It's difficult to put my finger on what it was because it wasn't just that I was female. Often there were plenty of, of women in the room. It was sometimes something more to do with a confidence or a sense of entitlement of being there that some people felt they had. And I often felt that somebody with my background, perhaps I couldn't do it, perhaps I couldn't make it. I didn't see role models of people that I felt at that time I could relate to. Looking back, though, there were people there, there were mentors, formal and informal, who drew alongside me and encouraged me to do things that I never thought would be possible. And if you are listening, you know who you are. And as I finish today's talk, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Firstly, how are you using your stories? How are you using your diversity to really enrich your working environment, but also society more broadly? Secondly, how are you embracing and empowering the members of your teams who may have extremely different perspectives to you? How are you supporting them in raising their voice and contributing their perspective to the way the research culture is, is set up. And thirdly, as, you, as I finish, what are you going to do now 
that is going to make a difference. I've already mentioned I am happy for people to contact me if they wish to discuss these matters further. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>